So with 2017 coming to an end, I figured now would be the best time to talk about the best and worst um, comic stories and manga I've read this year, and sort of a great way to just kick off the new year by talking about all the good and bad that came before it. So first off, we're going to start with some one of our better stories, um, courtesy of DC, which has been killing it in Rebirth. And it's very important to figure out exactly how well a book is doing, and that's well after the first two stories, or first two arcs. And for this one, I think Batman does the best job of, at least in my opinion, consistently being good. Um, the I Am Gotham story, uh, I Am Suicide, I Am Bane, were all really good stories, and they all really played off this really great theme of Batman's, um, of a sort of vulnerability that Batman has about himself and his future, which is sort of the direction Tom King goes with Batman as opposed to Scott Snyder's more epic, almost Justice League Unlimited style of Batman, where that Batman was very on top of his game and nearly unstoppable, like he even hit Darkseid and dodged Darkseid. His Batman is more akin to the one that when people think, oh well he can beat Superman, that's the one we would think of, Snyder's Batman. But with Tom King's Batman, I think the story that best sums him up is the events after I Am Bane, where he proposes to Catwoman and he tells Catwoman the story of the War of Jokes and Riddles. Which to me was a very was it was a bit of a difficult story to get into at first, just because it was told sort of differently. It's not being told from start to finish so much as being told this is happening, and in the background we have Batman trying to just sort of keep up with this um, gang war between Joker and Riddler's forces. It's really intense, and the fun and the premise of this is that Riddler can't solve the riddle of Batman, and Joker can't laugh. Primarily because he can't kill Batman. So it becomes this huge contest to see which of them will kill Batman first. Is it going to be Joker? Is it going to be Riddler? And Batman is sort of caught in the middle of this turf war because it's not just Joker and Riddler fighting. It's Deadshot and Deathstroke. Um, Solomon Grundy's in it. Clayface is in it. Mad Hatter. Kite Man. And Kite Man is super important in this story. And at the end of it, we sort of see exactly what makes a good Batman story. So in my mind... Two things really matter for a Batman story. Not in Batman's character, but in a Batman story. It's that you've done the fundamental thing of taking Batman out back and beating the snot out of him. Which Tom King did in I Am Bane. And you also have to make it not exactly a happy ending, but you know the story's been solved. The Mass of the Phantasm and Under the Red Hood are great examples of how to tell a really good Batman story. And... Nolan's um, Dark Knight movie and Batman Begins, I think, do a great job of that, too. Um, keeping in with the Batman lineup, there was Detective Comics. Now, Detective Comics has been sort of a mixed bag now, but it still has everything I liked about it in the beginning, especially with the ever-important story of Clayface. So for those of you that don't know, for Detective Comics, Batman is assembling a team to help him deal with some of the issues of Gotham City, most no, uh, originally it was the group called the Colony, and then it becomes a League of Shadows. Then it becomes a bunch of other smaller things. Some involve anarchy and time travel, in one form or another. And we have a very interesting cast of characters. And this whole thing sort of feels like a sequel to the Batman animated series, because um, we have Cassandra Kane as Orphan, not as Batgirl yet. We have Stephanie Brown as Spoiler. We have Batwoman, we have Asriel, and surprisingly we have Clayface. And Clayface has honestly been the best reason to keep reading this story along with Cassandra Kane. I think they've become such strong characters, especially with how they interact together, I think is important. Like Clayface is sort of allowed to be more than just this huge monstrosity. He's allowed to be a character with layers to him. Um, after that comes... Superman. Now, Superman, has, I dropped off on Superman about at the end of the Manchester Black story, but what makes the Superman story good is this very sort of wholesomeness to it, in the idea that it's not just Superman punching things, it's Superman raising his son John with his wife Lois, and we're addressing um, mysteries along with another book on this list, Action Comics, to sort of figure out what's been going on, like we actually have a retcon or more of an adjustment to explain the Superman issue. Because for those of you um, 
I don't know if you weren't reading New 52 Superman, you didn't, or New 52 at all, you didn't know that Superman had actually died and got sick, and instead of him coming back to life, what we had instead was a new Superman came from the pre-Flashpoint Earth, so Earth before Barry Allen goes back in time and messes things up. And there's a certain innocence to John that you just sort of love him as a character. You want to, you can't wait to see him grow. It's sort of something that I think we really wanted from Connor Kent, Superman, or Superboy. And here, it's really cool just watching his powers develop, his growing friendship with Damien, and just sort of seeing him grow. Because you, you really are interested in what sort of hero he's going to become. With, you know, a best friend like Damien and your dad is Superman. And who Who's influencing you more? More than likely your mother. Because John does love his mother fears. Um, Action Comics has been really good. I, have, I wasn't reading it consistently at first. Because there were just certain things that just were really stupid. Because it almost felt like Lex lost Doomsday when he came back for the fight. But Action Comics is a bit more ingrained in the average goings-on of the DC Universe. Like... Um, the character Mr. Oz, who we saw in DC Rebirth, is more prevalent of a figure here in Action Comics. We actually find out who he is in the story The Oz Effect. And then before that, we found out about the issue of Mr. Mixapitalik, and we explained exactly how there were two Supermen and the reality of the actual timeline. Remember, this is all at its, at its core, the question of what is Dr. Manhattan up to? And that came in play, that showed us a bit more in the event uh, uh, known as The Button, where Batman and The Flash go traveling to the Flashpoint universe to uncover the mystery of The Button that showed up in the Batcave. And The Button was actually a really great story. It's actually the only time I've been reading The Flash, just because I don't really like The Flash enough to read him. Although I probably will pick him up probably next year. Um, another book that I really enjoyed, but have also stopped, stopped from reading as much, is Wonder Woman. And Wonder Woman had an interesting start from New 52 to Rebirth. And a quick talk about New 52, because it goes into Rebirth, is the idea that Wonder Woman was not made of clay. And that upset some people, but not so much as her being the daughter of Zeus and Queen Hippolyta, and then her becoming the god of war. And honestly, I liked these changes, because I felt like we were really sort of... Um, dirtying up, not in, not in a good way, the um, Wonder Woman image. I think what's really hard for a lot of people getting into Wonder Woman is the fact that there's never really an event so much that makes her Wonder Woman. There's an event that makes Bruce Wayne Batman. There's an event that makes uh, Clark can't take up the mantle of Superman. With Wonder Woman and Batgirl sort of has the same thing. Um, they just sort of become these because they want to, and that's great, but there's this sort of personal drama with the idea that she may be something more and can become something more was good, even if it didn't really pan out so well. When Azarello wrote New 52, Wonder Woman, I thought it was good, though Wonder Woman was kind of the weakest part of that next to the Firstborn. Um, just because Azarello wrote such a good um, story in itself, it was sort of like Hellboy. Like, Azarello's Wonder Woman was like Hellboy. In other words, everything around is so interesting and... Everything else just sort of falls apart to it. But going into Rebirth, we had um, Diana coming to terms with the fact that something wasn't right about um, her past. Some things didn't line up. And that was her going uh, her going on an adventure to find out. And what Greg Rucker did when he told the story was he had us do one minute where, where seeing Diana figure out what's go well, how, a way to get to, back to Themyscira. And the next issue would be... Um, Wonder Woman leaving Themyscira, her first adventure, and her meeting with Ares. And that's really good, but there was a bit of a problem that it got a bit conflicting at times, because you really want to see this story going on here, and you felt that maybe the past story could have happened later, but it p panned out all right. And the problem Wonder Woman's having now is, while Rucka didn't really retcon anything, because he still didn't confirm whether or not Wonder Woman was the daughter of Zeus, but she still thinks she is, and she has a half-brother. So for all intents and purposes, we know. Well, not a half-brother, twin brother. So for all intents and purposes, Diana's still the daughter of Zeus. She may or may not be the god of war, we don't know the exact details, but what Rucka did was give us a solid um, introductory story, which was really good because Wonder Woman Earth-1 was kind of bad. 
but the issue now is I don't think we have a really solid storyline. This book has been kind of struggling to find its feet, in my opinion, with um, uh, Rucka having left the book. Because even the story about Wonder Woman's brother is not that as interesting as it should be. And this is interesting because thematically, in New 52, Wonder Woman had trouble where she couldn't keep the men in her life safe. And by the men in her life, I mean... She found she has a half-brother. She has, like, three half-brothers. They die. We find out that the Amazons have sent their men to um, work for Hephaestus in his forge. Wonder Woman brings them into the Themyscira when she becomes queen of the Amazons in that story. And the Amazons have those men slaughtered. She couldn't keep them safe. And now she has a brother. And I thought, well, this is a really cool thematic thing that she's trying to keep this um, person safe because she's yet to keep her family safe. But... Um, it just hasn't been working out so well. Maybe it's the direction, or maybe it'll all look better when we read that story in its entirety, you know. But because that Wonder Woman has sort of been the best and worst of DC, in my opinion. Um, next is um, Green Lanterns. So, I was a bit torn between Green Lanterns and How to Join the Green Lantern Corps. And I have to say Green Lanterns is a bit more fun because it sort of takes some of the best aspects of a Marvel book, which is the sort of personal element that Green Lanterns used to do like there's a story about how trying to get a job and John trying to get a job but with Green Lanterns the story of Jessica Cruz and Simon Boz as Green Lanterns has been really great and it wasn't just the Red Lantern story it was the um the Phantom Ring story it was the just seeing Jessica Cruz deal with her anxiety seeing Simon Boz learn to trust in himself not just the ring and then seeing them train on Oa to become Lanterns, and then having to fight Volthoom and train the first Lanterns was really great. And I think what really sells it is, this book is the diversity people have been wanting. And it's not shoved in your face diversity. The book itself never mentions, hey, you're Hispanic, you're a Muslim. And the only time him being a Muslim is even brought up throughout the entirety of DC Comics so far is when he got pulled over for stealing a car that we found out had nitroglycerin in it. I'm, I don't think that's a matter of profiling so much as you've got nitro in your car. What are you doing? You're, you're, you're a security risk now. You just happen to be Muslim. But there's also, again, it's just a sort of fun aspect to these characters and watching them grow because they're not as overly gifted as Hal or as emotionally secure as John or as erratically varying degrees of OP as Kyle Rayner or even as jerkish as Guy Gardner. They're each different and they each sort of play off of different lanterns differently. But everyone loves Kilowog. Jessica and Simon both love Kilowog. And that alone tells you they're great people. Next is Mr. Miracle, and honestly, I didn't know what to expect um, going into Mr. Miracle, and that's because I've never really understood him as a character. Um, I first started liking him in the Justice League Dark Side War event, because that book was great. He wasn't really a major force in the book, though. But here, it's good enough just to know that Tom King is on this book, and it's important that you know a writer when you get into a good book, because it just sort of eases you into it. And here, this book is sort of uncomfortable in a lot of ways, and it's uncomfortable in a good way, which is a bit weird. It's A lot of ways it's dealing with PTSD as um, Scott Free is taking a break from the... Um, New Gods War Against Darkseid. And we... I think the best way to sum it up is just how uncomfortable and real it is. Sort of like the same way the Flintstones had moments where in their book they got really real. With the idea of... The, finding out that Yabba Dabba Doo was actually a phrase to help soldiers deal with their trauma. The idea that um, Fred and Barney uh, participated in genocide during a war... Is, that's good, and Mr. Miracle sort of deals with that the same way, too, but it's also with the idea that he may, be, that Scott Free may be trying to kill himself, that Mr. Miracle may be trying to kill himself, and there's this other stuff going on on New Genesis, and I just have to know what's going on. I really wish this was a much bigger book. Like, I, I really want a New Genesis book, just because of this. If you want something 
that feels a bit more mature but still has superheroes to it, but isn't mature in that it's dealing with an obvious social commentary, I think Mr. Miracle is the book you're looking for. Um, taking a break from DC and going off to Marvel, um, two of the best books I read were actually earlier this year from Marvel. Um, Marvel is yet to show me a monthly title I want to invest all my money in, or all my money and time in, but Infamous Iron Man and Unworthy Thor were two of the best stories I've read this year now. Infamous Iron Man is the story of Doctor Doom becoming Iron Man, and it sounds a bit weird, especially with uh, how I said that, but there's some real beauty to it, primarily because Doom wants to be Iron Man because being God didn't satisfy him on an emotional level. It didn't fulfill him. And just sort of the idea of Doom saying, like, you know what? Being God didn't do it for me because he still remembers the events of Secret Wars when he had to hold the, this collapsing universe together. And he says, like, that didn't do it. Maybe I should be here. Maybe I should try to give instead of just be in charge. And it's kind of hilarious because he goes down to Tony's lab. And at, after this, this is the events of still um, Civil War II. So Tony's comatose slash dead. No one can really um, commit to either of these decisions. And what makes this work is the fact that he's like, Tony, I'm taking your armor. Like, I love you. I respect you. But I'm taking your armor. Tony's like, don't take my armor. And Tony takes, and he takes the armor. And this becomes a very interesting story because it, there's a really sort of subplot and it's also a bunch of other people interacting with him, especially um, a woman named Amara. She's She's been a prominent doctor in the Marvel Universe, and seeing her interactions with Victor Von Doom has always been great. And the end of this, there's like three endings in that last issue, and they're all really good, and I'm not going to spoil any of them for you. Um, next is Unworthy Thor. So Unworthy Thor is, I think, the book a lot of Thor fans really wanted especially since Jane Foster is now Thor. And even though Jane Foster's run is coming to an end, we all sort of wondered, what about Odinson? What about Odinson? Will he ever uh, become worthy to wield the hammer? Why was he unworthy to wield it before? This story is what tells us what Nick Fury whispered in Thor's ear to make him unworthy to wield the hammer. And we all had different um, theories and beliefs. Um, Rob from Comics Explained said that there was an enchantment that Nick Fury was able to lift off the hammer so that Thor couldn't lift it. Um, some people thought that Thor had actually done something really bad, and that's what he whispered. The truth is, what was revealed was, I think, very profound, and it sort of helps us see Odinson, or Thor, as a much more complex figure. The sort of complex figure that I think Jason Aaron always has written Thor to be, and I think that's really great. So if you want a really good Thor book, I would recommend you reading Unworthy Thor and give Jane Foss a try if you haven't already. She's, she does a great job as Thor. Um, coming up next is Star Wars and Darth Vader. So Star Wars has always been a bit of a rocky book um, for me because it's never consistently interesting. And when I go to Star Wars books, and this Star Wars book is takes place after the events of A New Hope and not and before Empire Strikes Back. So it has to work really hard to keep me interested because I don't really care, for the most part, what Han and Leia are doing. Even though I think they're great characters, I really, I'm really more interested in Luke. And he's sort of my fav one of my favorite characters in this franchise. But seeing him grow as a Jedi, because remember, he can't grow too far in this story because by Empire, he still, has, he still isn't able to lift rocks yet. As, as Ben Kenobi says in Empire Strikes Back, you can feel the force, but you can't control it. It doesn't obey your commands consistently. And that's what's happening here. We're seeing Luke try to tap into that power uh, consistently. He can only really do it and push comes to shove emotional moments. But this book has done a good job of keeping my attention, but not really maintaining it. I honestly would say this is possibly one of the lesser books. Like, it's almost one of the worst books I've read. Um, next is Darth Vader. I don't feel Darth Vader needed another book. This is his second book. He had one that came out the same time as Star Wars and was still and ended just recently. This new one takes place after the events of Revenge of the Sith, and new a new hope hasn't even started yet. This is very much a different take on the novel Dark Lord: The Rise of Darth Vader, and here we see Vader getting his lightsaber crystal, which he has to 
get from another Jedi and bleed it by uh, fueling it with his rage and hatred. He has to corrupt the crystal to an extent. A lot of people didn't like this. I feel that there was no reason for it. Synthetic crystals, I think, were better for Sith. And we get the idea of him training the Inquisitors. Like, we actually meet the Inquisitors we'll see in Rebels. And we meet Jedi who've taken the Barash Vow. And we even see Jocasta New. This book isn't bad, but I just find myself not really interested in these sort of retcons. Which has been, I think, a problem a lot of people in the Star Wars community have been having. It's not just a matter of butthurt, just sort of unnecessary changes designed to make money. But this book has still been good. Like, what I read is good. I just can't bring myself to care enough to keep reading it. Like, I enjoyed Kane and the Last Padawan. I enjoyed Obi-Wan and Anakin. Those were two really good books. And Charles Soule, who's writing Darth Vader, also wrote Obi-Wan and Anakin. So, this book is really worth looking at, I think. Now, on the list of my worst books... Actually, no, we have one more. We have we actually have um, two more books. Um, Captain America, Steve Rogers, which was the best thing about Secret Empire because it really gets in your face with the idea of what makes someone join Hydra and is someone who joins Hydra inherently a bad person with the idea of Steve Rogers being um, someone who's had his reality reworked that he was always in Hydra, giving him false memories of seeing everything good about Hydra from his perspective, which is not racism or intolerance. That's not what Hydra believes. Hydra does not support the ideas of, you know, killing people because they're different. They believe in control. There's no point in killing people who you can bring under your control. So we see in this one that Hydra, didn't even, Hydra wasn't even sure they wanted to join um, Germany in World War II. In their mind, it was just Hitler's a bit crazy. He's a, he's a madman. But they would they were going to just take they were going to join Hitler and they would just sort of replace Hitler's generals with their own and just sort of take over. And here we sort of see Red Skull making sense. We see Steve Rogers adopting an ideology that isn't really that different from his own, but it's the methods that they espouse by, um, which we'll see in Secret Empire. Um, finally, the last, um, great book I read, and still am reading, is Dark Knight's Metal, because, oh my god, Dark Knight's Metal is so good! Like, mm, the idea of a dark multiverse, trying to find its way into our positive multiverse, and spearheading it are a bunch of evil Batman, not even evil Batman, technically, but Batman who have failed, slash Batwomen, because Bryce Wayne. It's a really interesting concept and really interesting story here. And Scott Snyder's loving it because he's also bringing back things that we haven't seen in a while. We're seeing Mr. Terrific. He's back in. And he's going to be in the um, um, the Dark Matter series. He's, uh, we see a long gate. We see, not a long gate. Plastic Man coming back in. We see Dr. Fate fully back in the DC Universe. We see the Cosmic Tuning Fork. We see Hawkman, Hawkgirl, Vandal Savage... A lot of these things, we wonder, like, where are these characters? They're coming back. And it's really, really fun. So, we're going to end this best list by going into our worst list, which is actually kind of how you do it. Um, I don't really go out of my way to find books I'm not going to like. It's just sort of who I am. But negative criticism is fun to talk about. I just don't usually like to write it as much. It feels a bit lazy. But here... Um, one of the worst books I read this year had to have been Justice League. I think Justice League has been a huge disappointment. It's a series of... It's been a book of good ideas. It's very hard to come up with a bad idea for comic books. It's usually the execution of these books that don't work. Like the idea of the children from the future coming to warn in the present-day Justice League, seeing Wonder Woman's child son have a falling out with her. Like he just doesn't like her. Um, these are all interesting ideas, but they just always feel so flat and dull. And I think that book should never be boring. All right, Trinity is more interesting, and I stopped reading Trinity just because it just couldn't keep my interest to to an extent. Like I keep waiting for like the big moments. I think Trinity should only be should only come out like every once every couple of months, as opposed to twice a month. Like it should come out like. After every Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman arc, they should come together and they should just sort of like rehash that. That would be the better way to do it. But with the Justice League, I don't know. Like, 
in Green Lanterns, just to see Simon and Jessica on the Justice League, seeing them interact with everyone, is much better than actual Justice League. So, um, they need to fix this. I'm hoping Jonathan Hickman is writing Justice League, but from what I've heard, it's not going to be him. And it's too late for it to be Bendis, honestly. Um, another book that came out that I didn't quite enjoy was Secret Empire. And I think Secret Empire had the problem of having too much hype built into it. Because it's all really, it all really just sort of rides on the idea of um, you enjoying Captain America, Steve Rogers, you enjoy the Hydra thing. And the Hydra thing was really good, but just to sort of see Steve finally get it, it just feels a bit dull, really. And you keep hearing that this book was supposed to be shorter, it was supposed to be longer. And it, it's one of those moments where you think, you know, if you guys just sort of stopped interfering with people's books to this extent, we might be getting better stories. And there's a lot to like about Secret Empire, but overall, I just found this to have not been worth it. Like, I feel that if I had never read Secret Empire, I probably would have enjoyed it more. Just the idea of it, like hearing about it, I'm like, oh, that's so cool, that's so cool. And then it's like, uh... Like, the idea that Hank Pym plays a role in this in this sort of race for um, cosmic cube shards, that Black Panther's calling Hydra Supreme Steve out, that it comes down to... Hydra Steve dressed like Iron Man, but with a different color scheme, fighting a Cosmic Cube creation of Steve Rogers. And they're sort of fighting for um, the Hammer of Thor, and they should have also been fighting for the Cosmic Cube. And just to see that, hey, it works, you, turns out you can always punch a Nazi, even though Captain America had a comic where it's not okay to punch a Nazi. So, I just don't know where we're... I don't know, like the... The final like issue at the end of Secret Empire, that issue was really good. It it was sort of like Captain America Civil War, not um Civil War to the Oath. That book was really good. The idea of this sort of conversation coming in the good guy's face, I think, is something that needs to happen a lot in comic books. That heroes should be forced to hear the rational arguments from people who they are diametrically opposed to, and uh, we're gonna call him Good Steve. Good Steve came out good here because. He feels like the actual Steve, because that's who he's been created as. And he says, like, I want to thank you, because people are afraid of me. They're starting, going to start to question my authority. They're going to question everything, and that's what they should be doing. They shouldn't just accept a any authority solely on the grounds of, like, well, it's this guy or that guy, which is actually really interesting, because the main reason this all happened was because no one questioned whether or not Steve Rogers should have as much power as did under the S.H.I.E.L.D. Act. And that was really great. And the idea that, you know, Hydra C threw in the fact that the only reason I'm in here is because I politically disagree with you. I mean, Scarlet Witch, Quicksilver, all the people they killed, you've had them on the Avengers. And that's sort of what made everything about Hydra Steve great was that he was throwing everything back in the faces of heroes, his critique of them, the fact that heroes had stopped being heroes. They were, they politicized being a superhero. And it sort of reminded me of why Superman doesn't publicly endorse um, candidates. He just sort of keeps it to himself. And I think that's an interesting idea. I don't think we see a lot of superheroes in politics. We see superheroes addressing political issues. But never actual politics. Except for the time Green Arrow ran for mayor. Or when Rhodey was hinted at to becoming president before he was killed off. Um, another book that... I think didn't really work for me with Star Wars Dr. Aphra, and I try to like Dr. Aphra, but it's, I need to see her interact with other characters more, like she, she interacts with Leia a bit, she interacts with Luke, she had a really great little interaction with Luke in the Screaming Citadel, and I think people were thinking at some point that Dr. Aphra and Luke might have been Rey's parents, which I think might have been cute, and might have been fun, I think we're all just sort of finding, we, we want to see the direction Star Wars goes that feels a bit more like the like the EU we knew but I don't think that's ever gonna happen I just sort of think that I want to give them points for creating a new character with Dr. Aphra but I don't think I've yet to find the issue that says I need to keep reading this so I'm just gonna sort of put it as one of the worst books because it's in a it's in a point in the Star Wars franchise where you don't really have to care what's going on and finally, the worst book of 2017 for me was Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps. And this is a bit controversial because 
I like Hal Jordan. I like Jon Stewart. I like I love the Green Lantern Corps. But this book has never been consistent with keeping my interest. Because I didn't like how they handled Sinestro in the first story. Especially after Cullen Bunge run on Sinestro, which was stellar. It was amazing. It was beautiful. And here he's just sort of like a downgrade. Like, who is this guy? This is not the Sinestro who became the guardian of the universe when the Lantern Corps had when the Green Lanterns had just disappeared. Here was just sort of, yeah, evil, 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 evil. I'm Sinestro when I'm evil, because my name's Sinestro. Um, like, the best things about this book have always sort of been what Jon Stewart is doing, what um, what we're doing in regards to the core. The idea of the Green Lantern Corps and the Sinestro Corps working together in Sinestro's absence, I felt was a really cool idea. And even more because Soronic was not only Sinestro's daughter, but she was also trying to lead the Corps, and she was a Green Lantern who was tasked with leading the Sinestral Corps with the best interests of the Sinestral Corps in mind. So she's going to use the Sinestral Corps to protect the universe, and then she finds out that Kyle Rayner kept his huge secret from her, and it felt like drama for the sake of drama. I felt that what should have really ended this would be a coup in the Sinestral Corps, which deposes Saronic, and... That I think would have been a lot better than this time travel madness. Because it feels like they've undone something that Kyle Rayner was trying to undo by not getting with Saronic so that way their son doesn't go crazy and try to kill off the Green Lanterns by traveling to the past. It just felt really depressing and unnecessary. Like, I may pick this book up again, but if I had to choose between How Joe and the Green Lantern Corps and Green Lanterns, I'd probably pick Green Lanterns nine times out of ten. So, coming on to manga, there's no best words for manga. I've only read two mangas um, so far that I've read more than three three volumes of. Um, uh, a current manga that I'm also reading is Ancient Maker's Bride, but I want to read one more volume of that before I actually give my opinion of that. It's also, I think, it's also think it came out. Well, it's not finished, so I can review it whenever. But Black Clover and My Hero Academia were the two... Vault were the two mangas I read, primarily at the recommendation of people. Um, I loved getting recommendations about things to read. Um, I love a magic-based universe, so when I was kind of burnt out on Fairy Tale, because Fairy Tale just let the world down, I'll say it and I'll say it again. Um, Black Clover was supposed to be a sort of apparently a better version of Fairy Tale, and I read it. It's not a better version of Fairy Tale; it's a less irritating version of Fairy Tale, at least so far, because I don't have to worry about whether or not Urza's going to survive, because Urza always survives. But the I, the problem with Black Clover is not Asta. Asta's personality is really great in the manga, because there's a certain amount of humility to him. Like, he's sort of Naruto mixed with Luffy, and that would sound really, really annoying. But my favorite moment for Asta has to be not only his drive for improvement, but when he's at this party and everyone's, like, very vocal about how... They don't like him, how he sucks, how he's a sort of bumpkin. He's just eating food going, like, wow, they really landed into me. And just keeps eating like he just, it, it's not worth his time. But my big issue with Black Clover has to be the pacing, which is really fast. Like, I don't know when manga was supposed to be this fast paced. Like, I feel that we're all, I'm only about five volumes in. And I feel we've already ended the tuning exams in Naruto. Like, that's how much we've gotten. And at the same time, I'm not really interested. I don't. I'm not a big fan of the power creep. Like Asa's powers, Juno's powers, are all developing at I think at a rate too fast. Because Black Clover sort of operates on the same principle of Zatch Bell, where you have this book that has these spells in it, and it seems that there's no real limit to when you get these. Because we see Juno, another character, who's just re he's studying his grimoire, where Asa just starts training with his anti magic sword, and. He, I really hate when people as young as Asta and you know, which has to be like maybe 15 at the oldest, are able to fight off people who have been doing this for years. Like Naruto got away with it because in the beginning there was this huge implementation of strategy and clever tactics to defeat opponents. And then by Shippuden that kind of went out the window for the most part, but there was still an aspect of strategy to it. And here it just seems if Asta just needs a different sword or a bigger swing. So it's got the Bleach and Fairy Tale problem. Um, My Hero Academia is possibly my favorite manga series of the year, and it's become so good that I'm actually reading it as it comes out 
in America. Like I'm actually investing the cash to have the volumes myself. And I think it's because Deku was such a rarity in Shonen. He's, I, I know that when it comes to Shonen, we're all really tired of the Naruto, Goku, Luffy, Asta, and even Ichigo to an extent. Like Ichigo came off as being a very interesting character on the surface, but he just became so dull. I've never seen a protagonist so boring in an anime or manga. And with Deku, well, Izuku, I just love calling him Deku. Um, Deku is very much a Yugi Moto, Hanaturo, Yo, Asakura, Kenshin character, and that he's more intelligence based. He's more, he's less about telling you how he's feeling, and more about letting you sort of interpret it in the story in the more subtle moments. For him, which Naruto used to be really good at before, and Izuku is really good at being sort of the middle ground. Like, he's not totally in a. Um, an intelligence-based character because he loves to have that slugfest. He's very passionate about what he's doing. That's sort of the direction of My Hero Academia is that um, you're not, they're not going to throw away their, their shot, their opportunities. It means more to them than just sort of like family honor. They're all here for reasons that are unique to them to try to become professional heroes. And that is where I think the real passion and drive of My Hero Academia comes from. Also with um, the power creep, which is also really good. Like everyone has special powers, but these powers have limits. They have restrictions, and they're all training to overcome them in actual practical ways. And this, I think, helps you get into it. And it's more of an ideological process into the idea of superheroes, which we saw in the form of Stain, and even Endeavor is sort of questioning the idea of what is a symbol of peace. So it's become a very very great series to read like I can't really recommend this manga any more than I already have and finally we're sort of breaking our rule which I said was that if you only had two to three issues yeah you it can't be on the list but Legend of Korra has started its own um, graphic novel series along with Avatar The Last Airbender which had one a good while ago actually it's still going on um, it takes place a few I want to say a few weeks maybe even less than a week after the events of Legend of Korra. So Korra and Asami, we see them have a little adventure in the spirit world. And they're coming back to it and they're seeing a world that's pretty much the same. But there's a difference to them. They're, they're now a couple. They've introduced themselves to Korra's parents. And we also see this sort of uh, more tensions growing between the spirits and the humans. And as interesting as the spirits and humans thing is, the real focus is for the most part on Korra and Asami. And... That's fine, really, because Korra and Asami felt like it came out of left field. Now, people can say, well, it, the evidence is there. Like, she was only writing to Asami. But even then, she saw, she stopped writing to Asami. I mean, you could literally just say Korra and Asami were best friends at that point. Which I think made sense. And I'm totally okay with them being a couple, though. Hashtag Korra and Bolin for life, you know. But, you know, we've all had ships that sink. And... What I liked about this um, story so far is that it delved into how um, same-sex relationships are treated in the world of Avatar The Last Airbender. And Korra has an argument with, well, not even an argument, she just sort of blows up at her parents because they're sort of saying, well, hey, it's cool and all, but keep it under wraps. You know, a lot of people won't, or won't be as accepting. And Korra just sort of bites her parents' heads off, and they later talk to Kaya, who we turn, who, um, who was able to figure, oh yeah, you two are a couple now, because, uh, you know, Kai is also gay, and what's really cool about that was Kai says, well, Water Tribe culture is all about um, you keeping that um, that emotional, romantic side in the house, all right, no one's going to disown you, we have a deep love of community and friendship, but we, we like that, that we prefer you to keep any of your romantic history and your love life to yourself, so it's more of the fact that the Water Tribe isn't really big on PDAs, public displays of affection. And then we find out that, you know, when Kai came out to her father, Aang was nothing short of supportive. He was really cool about it. I mean, the Air Nomads would be totally cool with it. Love is love, whatever. Um, the Fire Nation, the Fire Nation sort of outlawing it during Sozin's time makes sense. It's hard to tell Sozin's personality because I don't think Sozin is inherently a bad person. He's a guy that wanted to expand Fire Nation culture and the Fire Nation to its highest. He has a very militaristic sense. So I think his decisions to outlaw homosexuality comes from the idea that there's nothing, 
practical or to benefit from homosexuality because you can't produce children no matter what you are and so you can't further the fire nation line you can't further the great war machine um ozai would just sort of keep it going because uh, ozai as a character he's a product of his gen of you know the generations that came before him the earth kingdom was interesting because avatar kyoshi is outed by kaya you know she loved men and women but the earth kingdom was not that accepting they're very hesitant to change and new ideas and i felt that this entire volume was worth it just to find out that little bit of world building which this series has always been good at like legend of coral was not a a really great series and i think i should probably do a video on at some point talking about my feelings and stances on especially since volume two is coming out next month but the world building has always been something this series has been good at the only weak point about this is oh my god it's still mako i don't know how mako succeeds at being such a dull boring character still but he does it he does it and hopefully we'll get more from him i want mako to succeed i want mako to stop being the dead weight but guys putting mako with bolin was not the way to make him not be dead weight bolin steals every scene he's in he's literally the best thing about legend of korra and you put him with one of the worst things about legend of korra the other thing was korra but i'm optimistic and maybe opal but whatever 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 so that's about it for the best um comics manga and graphic novel best and worst for 2017 if there was something you read that um you feel should be on either of these lists please feel free to leave that in the comments and i will catch you all later hopefully with another best of before the year is out this is the bucket think tank signing out may your fandom serve you well